This is a great day, wonderful day. This is a day the Lord's made. Amen. And we can rejoice and be glad in it. Amen? Amen? And we will rejoice and be glad in it. Every day you have a choice to be mad, sad, or glad. Which one are you choosing? Amen. Praise God. Well, it's good to be with you guys. This is a brand new course uh, it, it called Establishing a Prosperous Soul. And you, th this is one of my favorite courses. You guys are going to be super blessed. I know encouraged and helped. This is how many of you have heard Andrew teach on spirit, soul, and body? Okay, this is very complimentary course to to uh, Andrew's uh, message on that because when Andrew is teaching spirit, soul, and body, which part is he emphasizing? Spirit. Well, we're going to emphasize the soul. All right, and and you here's the bottom line: you get your soul in line with your your soul in line with your spirit. The life that's in your spirit is going to flow freely, and and you just auto, automatically start receiving the benefits of of the gospel of the of of all that we have in Christ. Amen. But it, but it's uh, the key to us receiving that is what's going on in our soul. All right, I'm going to tell you funny. Is that okay? This is called a dead duck. So a woman brought a very limp duck into a, into a veterinary surgeon. And as she laid her pet on the table, the vet pulled out his stethoscope and listened to the bird's chest. After a moment or two, the vet shook his head and said, sadly, I'm sorry your duck cuddles, ma'am, has passed away. Well, the distressed woman wailed and said, are you sure? Yes, I'm very sure. She said, your duck is dead, replied the vet. Well, how can you be so sure, she protested. I mean, you haven't even done any testing on him or anything. <clears throat> he might just be in a coma or something. The vet rolled his eyes, turned around, and left the room. He returned a few minutes later with a black Labrador retriever. As the duck's owner looked on in amazement, the dog stood on his hind legs, put his front paws on the examination table, and sniffed the duck from top to bottom. He then looked up at the vet with sad eyes, shook his head, the vet patted the dog on the head and took it out of the room. A few minutes later, he returned with a cat. The cat jumped on the table and also delica delicately sniffed the bird from head to foot. The cat sat back on its haunches, shook its head, <laughs> meowed softly, and strolled out of the room. The vet looked at the woman and said, I'm sorry, ma'am, but as I said, <clears throat> this is most definitely 100% certifiably a dead duck. The vet turned to his computer terminal, hit a few keys, and produced a bill which he handed to the woman. The duck's owner, still in shock, took the bill, $150? She cried, $150? Just to tell me my duck is dead? The vet shrugged, I'm sorry, ma'am, if you had just taken my word for it, the bill would have been 20, but with the lab report and the CAT scan. <laughs> now it's 150. <laughs> that's funny. I don't care who you are. That's funny. <laughs> okay, so the focus of this course is soul prosperity. Yes? Third John verse 2. Beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in health just as your soul prospers. Material prosperity and physical health affect us all. Would you agree? Yes. Each of these, though, are the fruit of a prosperous soul. Prosper defined here means su succeed in business affairs to have a good journey. How many of you know it's not a good journey to be sick or broke? And if you're consistently having problems in your finances, 
or health, you need to check out uh, to, to see how well your soul is. We sing that song, It's Well With My Soul. Here's my question to you. What's the condition of your soul? How well is it with your mind, will, and emotions? And how well is your mind, will, and emotions lined up with the Word, the Spirit, and with various authorities in our lives? Now, let me give you kind of the genesis of, of how this course came about. It's actually more of a message, uh, and, and I've got a book on this called A Prosperous Soul um, that you can, you can get on, online or uh, in, our, in our bookstore. But uh, 3 John verse 2, um, turn, turn there with me, okay, in your Bibles. 3 John verse 2, okay. I was reading, I, had, I, had, I, I was reading a brand new Bible, at the beginning of a year, of, of this year, um, and I felt like the Lord told me He had brand new revelation for me. If I would just read it, if I just read the Bible and be open and read it like I haven't read it before. And when I read through the Bible, I don't. I I, I read Genesis and then I go to Matthew and then and then I read Exodus and then I'll uh, actually I go from Matthew to Acts because I don't like reading Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John together. And then I'll go back to uh, Numbers or Leviticus, whichever one. It, and then, you know, and I, I, I go back and forth like that. And then I'll go to Mark and then Romans. And, and anyway, so I'll read a book at a time. And so I was reading throughout the, the Bible, and, and uh, it, I was, this was the beginning of the year. And about August, I got to 3 John, Okay. And I, I was reading, and, and up until this time, uh, I hadn't received, if I, if I hadn't received any new revelation that was life-changing. But this morning, this one morning, I, it, I, it was like this was worth the entire year. And sometimes, guys, we're, we're seeking God, and we want to we get those nuggets on skimming along the top on the surface, but sometimes we have to drill like we're, we're drilling for, for oil or water or something, yeah? And so I was reading this, and, and I read it like I'd never read it before. Beloved, I wish above all things you may prosper and be in health even as, everybody say even as, yeah. your soul prospers. Now I've heard that verse quoted and taught I don't know how many times. And, and, it, and it was accurate that God wants us to prosper. Yeah? How many of you heard that verse quoted, God wants us to prosper? And God wants us to walk in health. How many of you have heard it preached and taught? And, and, that, and that would be true, wouldn't it? But I, for, for some reason, the last phrase of that, even as your soul prospers, it was like a light show was going off in my, in my soul. And Roddy, it was like, I, for the first time, I'd never read even as your soul prospers. And I started to, wait a minute. You, you mean my financial, my financial well-being and my physical health is dependent upon my soul prospering? Is that what it says? Even as your soul prospers? I'm not talking about you can't get healed or that, you, that God can't bless you if your soul's not prospering, but needing to be healed and walking in health are two different things. How many of you know walking in health is better? And, and how many of you know uh, needing to receive a financial blessing is one thing, but walking in, in, a, in a level of prosperity where you don't need something every, day to day, how many of you know that's gooder? That's more gooder. That's that's better. And and so I'm reading this and I'm thinking, I've never heard anybody preach this before. And I started to get mad. God, if this is so, if this is true, why haven't I ever heard anybody teach this before? He said, Well, I'm teaching it to you right now. And I, man, I, it was like, 
And, and, then, and then I said, well, you know, if this was me, <laughs> and this is this important, that, that people's financial uh, prosperity and their physical health is dependent upon their soul prospering, I would have written about 12 chapters. Right? I wouldn't have just written one chapter. I said, Lord, you know, and so I, I, I told, told the Lord my unbelief about that. And he said, well, I wrote a book. <laughs> and so for the next weeks and months, I started studying about, about how my soul could prosper. And I'm telling you, we, I, and then I tested it on the laboratory of my church. And Paul Milligan and I started teaching along this line. And you know what happened? We saw what this verse says. We saw it. Our people experienced their marriages were more healthy. Their relationships were more healthy. Their bodies were more healthy. Their finances were, were more consistently prosperous. God, we, we had a gold mine here, guys. Are you hearing me? If this means what it says... Then, then we better be students of what it means for us, our souls to prosper. And essentially, it just means, uh, in, in, I mean, I'm just, you know, Cliff Notes version, your, your soul lines up with your spirit. We were created, Genesis uh, 126, we were created in His image. Everybody say His image. His likeness. And, and we have dominion. Everybody say His image, His likeness, have dominion. His image and His likeness are not the same thing. Otherwise, it wouldn't be distinct in a list. His image is our spirit man when we're born again. His likeness is our soul when it comes in line with our spirit. To the degree that our soul lines up with our spirit, we're going to walk in greater dominion. Guys, this, this is powerful. This is amazing. This is, I mean, how many of you, is this, this is the first time you've heard this? This is, uh, you know, praise God. I'm just, I'm, I just started, I started praising God. I started worshiping. I started, I, I started studying it. And th this became, um, this became the passion of, of, of my, of my life and ministry is where the apostle Paul prayed why did he pray for the Galatian church in Galatians 4.19 that Christ before, I, I travail in birth again, that Christ be formed in you? He's, who's he praying for? He's praying for Christians. Why would he have to pray for a Christian that Christ be formed in him when, when, when we already have Christ in us wall to wall in our spirit because not automatically so in our soul. And guys, that this is the key. This is the key to a successful Christian life is how is our soul lining up with our spirit and that's what this course is about. That's what we're going to talk about. And you know what? I don't this is not an all encompassing, you know, comprehensive message because I don't have the end a word on the on this subject. You can read it in the Bible yourself and find out things uh, that I won't even teach you about about how your soul can prosper. But I can tell you this: that the life that's in your spirit, man, has no ability to manifest where we experience it apart from your soul coming into agreement with it. Do you think it's important? Good preaching, Pastor Greg. Hallelujah. So we sing that song, It's Well With My Soul. So what, what is the condition of your soul? And, and when we read even as, just as, it means according to or only as much as. So financial blessing and physical health are in direct proportion to the degree that our soul is prospering. God is saying here to us that our soul must experience a good journey before our pocketbook, our business, or our body will. Are you hearing me? Is this important? Yes. As indeed your soul is keeping well. Uh, Moffat translation says, Proverbs 22.5. 
Thorns and snares are in the way of the crooked and perverse. He that does keep or guard his soul shall be far from them. He'll, he, he will prosper and be in hell. The majority of Christians' chronic problems is related to failing to keep their soul well. Yes? yes? Many people's souls are so cluttered with unforgiveness, bitterness, anger, greed, pride, lust, idolatry, fear, worry, cares, that it crowds, it crowds Jesus and His life out. Okay, look. Revelation 3.20. <coughs> Jesus said, Behold, well, let me just ask you, who's He writing? Who's He speaking to? He's speaking to the church. He said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man open the door, I'll come in with him and sup with him and he with me. What are you talking about, Jesus? He's on the outside looking in. How could that be possible with a Christian? It's not. He's not on the outside looking in. He's on the inside looking in. Amen. And he's, he's knocking on the door of, of our soul and saying, let me in. I want full expression in the dirty laundry drawers and closets of your soul. If your will, your, your mind, your will and emotions, I want you to let me in. Will, he's, he's, on, he's on the inside knocking on the doors of our soul. Will you let me in? There's a lot of Christians saying, no, I'm going to do things my way. Sing with, sing with Frank Sinatra the theme song of hell. I did it my way. <laughs> Guys, we, 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 have, we, we have a job to do and that's yielding our soul. It's not, it, 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 is, it, does involve, it does involve our minds being renewed, but, but that's not the only part of your soul. Your mind, will, and emotions. So you're, that, it also involves your will and your emotions being conformed or yielded to. Yeah? It's, it's when you tell Jesus He's Lord. Everybody say, Lord, Lord. Jesus. Jesus. He's Lord. He's Lord. But when you say, you know, the Lord asks you, well, when you graduate here, I want, I want you to go to third year. And, and you're thinking, well, I'm, I'd like to just graduate and go. And you say, no, Lord. Or, you know, I'm asking you to go to China or I'm asking you to go to Mexico or I'm asking you to go to some difficult place. And you say, no, Lord. How many of you know, no, Lord is an oxymoron. It's a moronic ox. <laughs> no, no, Lord. <laughs> If he's Lord, what's the answer? Yes. yes. Everybody say yes Lord. yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. We have a lot of what we have a lot is a bit lot of Billy Goat Christians. <laughs> it, it is, I, I love my pastor, but I love my husband, but I believe by his stripes I'm healed, but I'll go anywhere, Lord, but whatever's on the other end of your butt is what you really believe. <laughs> Put that in your no going where God tells you to go pipe and smoke it. Look guys, you, we can't even begin to, to comprehend or apprehend you know, the will of God for our lives if we're not seeking Him with all of our hearts and you can't seek Him with all, all of your heart until, uh, with all the soulish part of your heart until you get rid of all the buts and nevers. Amen. Well, I'll, never, I'll do anything, but I'm, I'm never getting married again, bless God. I'm never going to pastor. I'm never going to do this. Well, I'm never going to do this. You haven't even begun to seek God. And you won't even begin to hear God. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 7. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 15. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 7. Three times says the same thing. Today, if you will hear uh, His voice, harden not your hearts. 
How do we harden our heart? How, how many of you want to hear his voice today? Okay, hard, here's the answer. Three times, harden not your heart. How do, we, how do we harden our hearts? Well, I'll go anywhere, but I don't want to go back home. I don't want to come to third year. I don't want to go. Listen, you get all the, you, I, Lord, I'll go anywhere. If I know it's you, I'll go anywhere and I'll do anything. Even if it means going to Seagoville, Texas, Childress, Texas, and Pritchett, Colorado. Amen. On my way to, to, yeah, right, on my way to fame and fortune. Le leaving Houston, Texas, and going to Decatur, Texas, where the whole city rolls up at, at six o'clock at night. I thought God was sentencing me to anonymity. But but if you want if you want to, but that's where I met Andrew. That's where I met Paul Milligan. That's where I met my pastor Bob Nichols. God, guys, God does big big things from small places, but He can't do it with a, with a with a but or a never in your heart. I'll go anywhere and I'll do anything. Say I'll go anywhere. I'll do anything. I want my soul to prosper. Your soul prospers when you're yielded to Him, guys, and I'll go. I'll do whatever you tell me to do. As long as I know it's you and it lines up with your word, I'm there. And you can't hear God apart from that, guys. I'm, I'm appealing to you today. There's someone watching online, and I want to, I forgot to. I forgot to uh, welcome those that are watching online, but I, there's someone watching online, and 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 no doubt someone here that you you you've been asking God what what He wants you to do, but you can't you cannot hear Him because you're not willing to go anywhere and do anything. Are you hearing me? But today we change that. Our soul's going to start prospering because we'll go. I'll go, God. I'll go. If you tell me to go, I'll go to the end of the earth. Yes? yes. How can you make sure your soul is keeping well so you so you're not lying when you're singing? It's well with my soul. So we're going to begin to talk about that now. Let's uh, let, let's talk about the first principle of become, your soul becoming prosperous. How many of you are interested now in, a, in your soul prospering? Okay, first principle. The prosperous soul comes to Jesus regularly for rest. The prosperous soul comes to Jesus regularly for rest. Where, where, did, you, where did you get that from, Greg? It's real simple. It's in the Bible. You know, like I said, God, how come you didn't, if this is so important, of a principle, how come you didn't write 12 chapters? And he told me, he said, I wrote a book. I want you to study my word because I have a lot to say about, about how to have a prosperous soul. Yeah? And guys, this is not just a message I'm preaching. This is a life that I live. And, and it's something we've taught our people and, I'm, and I've seen it bear fruit in people's lives. So, Number one, a prosperous soul comes to Jesus regularly for rest. Matthew uh, eleven twenty-eight 28 through 30, come to me. Come to who? Jesus. Come to Jesus. All you who labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your, for your souls. Rest for, for what? For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So the first thing to understand about a prosperous soul is that the soul needs rest if it's going to prosper. If it's going to be kept well. Just like the body needs rest for health, the soul needs, needs rest if it's going to prosper. And we allow our souls to get so weighed down with pressures and stress and anxiety and troubles and cares that it can't rest. And, and, and you, you're going to see this on your test. Thank you, Greg. Number three, you're going to see it on your test. An unrestful soul is an unprosperous soul. True? 
This kind of soul works so hard, the body cannot rest, causing burnout, exhaustion, depression, and nervous breakdowns. How many of you know that's not the will of God? And Jesus is implying in this passage that a primary cause of souls failing to find rest is due to people taking yokes and burdens upon them that are not from Him. Did you see that? He said, look, I, I want you to come to me. If you're, if, you're, if you're weighed down in your soul, if you're heavy, if you're burdened, uh, if you're heavy laden, if you're stressed, come to me and you'll find rest for your souls because my yoke is easy, my burden is light. What is he telling us there? Whenever the Lord asks you to do something, it's not going to be heavy in your soul. Amen. Whenever people ask you to do something or you commit to do something that the Lord didn't give you permission to do, that's going to weigh you down. Yes. And here, what, here's what happens. People make commitments and accept responsibilities that Jesus did not initiate or lead them to do. And then they, then they end up worn out, frustrated, quitting everything, including the things He did lead them to do. Now don't go out here from this message and go quit everything. <laughs> because, you, because you see that the Lord's showing you you made a commitment that the Lord didn't initiate. How would you, what would be the best way to do that? Don't go leave somebody hanging. Just go tell them, look, you know what? I see that this is something that the Lord didn't initiate in my life and it's, it's weighing too much on me. So I'm going to come and let you know. I'm going to give you two weeks notice or a month or something until you can, or, or I'll help you find somebody to, uh, for my replacement. But don't just go dump it on them because then you're putting a burden on them. And that's on you. And God's not pleased with that. Are you hearing me? But too many times, guys, that's what we're, we're, we're living in the fear of man and we're committing to do things that we haven't even prayed about. Is that, Lord, is this part of your yoke and your burden for me? Or is this just people trying to put something on me? Or is that just me Try, uh, taking that burden because I don't want to. I don't want to uh, disappoint somebody, <coughs> guys. You, look, Jesus said, "If my yoke's easy, my burden's light." Okay, every place, er, every book of the New Testament, I think, except one, it says, "Grace and peace, grace and peace, grace and peace, grace and peace." Yeah. What does that mean? Grace. grace and peace go together, yeah. like Andrew and Jamie, like Greg and Janice like peas and carrots, right? What else does it mean? Whenever you've left peace, you've left grace. And that's not a condemnation. That's just a barometer that will show you, you know, you've, you committed to do something God didn't give you grace for. And you certainly can't have faith for something God didn't give you grace for. If God gave you, if it's part of His grace assignment to you, peace is going to be there. Okay, but you know, even when God asks you to do something, you can start doing it in your own strength. When, when they asked me to uh, be the dean of education here, I, I pastored for 27 years, so I knew how to pastor. But I didn't even know what a dean did. And so you know what I had to do? I had to lean into deaning grace. And, and then they asked me to be the director here. And now that's like fly, going from flying a Cessna 172 to flying a 747. Things come at you a lot faster. I had to lean into director grace. I do, I'm not going to do anything God asked me to do Leaning into my own natural understanding or my own strength. I'm gonna if I look if I what I'm what I'm saying is I'm not doing anything outside of God's peace because I know that's where I have grace, and I'm not gonna leave peace to do a job. And be, otherwise, it gets burdensome. It gets it 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 becomes it becomes more than you can handle you end up stressing out burning out and jesus said here's your problem you need you haven't been coming to me 
You come to me, I'll show you what I've given you grace for. And I'll show you where you're leaning to yourself and depending on yourself. Guys, that, you can't have a prosperous soul that's full of stress and absent of peace. It doesn't, it doesn't work. Amen. And life doesn't work that way. And I've never one time has God ever asked me to do something I felt 100% adequate to do. So what do I do? I lean, I, I lean into His adequacy. And I follow His peace. And therefore my soul prospers. And that I don't burn out. You know why people burn out? Is they're either doing something God didn't give them an assignment to do, or they're doing it in their own strength. And I came here today, guys, to tell you that God's, God's got kingdom assignments for you. Okay? I mean, I'm talking about, listen, I, I'm, not, I'm not patronizing you. There are world changers in this room, and those are watching online. There, there are champions in Christ here. There, there are um, church planters here. There, there, there are business planters here. There, there are marketplace in, uh, people here. There are uh, inventors here. There, I mean, there, there are kingdom leaders here. There, there are po uh, new, I mean, new political leaders here. I mean, all, ki all kinds of wonderful, life-changing things that God's got in your... There, there are miracles, signs, and wonders evangelists in this room that people... Nobody knows your name except the Lord and maybe a few of us, but God's, God's going to make your name great because you're going to make His name great. Yes. But guys, I'm just telling you, you, you can't... And I, I, I'm telling you as somebody who's been in ministry 40, 40 plus years, you cannot do this and do it, and do it in His strength and His grace without doing it in His peace. And, and here's, the, here's the good news. He's not asking you to do it in your own strength. Whatever He's put in your heart, guys, you just lean strong into His grace. He said, be strong in the grace of God. Second, Second Timothy 2, verse 1. I want my soul to prosper. How about you? And so the first thing is, you know, we've got to, we've got to come regularly to Jesus for rest. I mean, you know, I'm, I mean, daily wouldn't be a bad thing, would it? I don't get religious about this, but man, I need, I need my time with Jesus. You know, people are always going to be demanding for your time, but I tell you the time I need most is my time with Jesus. Because he helps sort things out for me and things I'm confused about. And he sets priorities for me and shows me where his assignment is for me and shows me where I have overcommitted. And man, and in a way I don't have to quit. I don't have to burn out. I'm, I, listen, guys, I'm telling you something. What I'm sharing with you today is, is a life I live. This is not just some message I'm preaching. Rest here defined. He said, I'm going to give you rest for your souls. It means, and it's the Greek word anaposis, which means pause, intermission, refresh, and take ease. Pause, intermission, refresh, and take ease. We can only receive ease and refreshing and intermission for our souls by coming to Jesus and leaving the stress, worries, pressures, and even the dishes behind. Ladies. And, and, and men, you might get a clue. It, it might be good for you to go wash a load of dishes from time to time. Amen. All the ladies said. Amen. The first things many of us do when faced with these kinds of things is to retreat in some, to some form of entertainment and hobby. There's nothing wrong with physical entertainment and fun but it will not bring complete rest to your soul. So this man right here, he's got his, you're wearing glasses, gray hair, and you're, you got, yeah, right there. What is your name? Stein. 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 Listen, God's speaking to you, Stein. He has 
kingdom assignments for you that are very significant. Your best days are ahead of you, not behind you. If you'll seek him and be willing to lay a few things aside, you're going to pick up a king, kingdom assignment and then, and then subsequently assignments that are going to knock it out of the park. And, and man, many, many people are going to come into the kingdom and many disciples are going to be made. In Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God. So, you know, it's okay. I, I like to enjoy. I like to laugh. I like to watch comedies. I like to, you know, chill out. How many of you know that's good? But that's only temporary relief. It's coming to Jesus regularly. Look at, look at Luke chapter 10 with me. Luke chapter 10. And this is a story of Mary and Martha. And verse 38. Now it happened as they went that they entered a certain village and a certain woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary who also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. So what does that mean when, when it says that she also sat at his feet? That means that Martha, Martha spent time listening to the word as well as Mary. And Martha was distracted with much serving and she approached him and said, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to serve. So what does that tell us? That, Mar that Mary had been serving. So this isn't about, you know, pitting uh, devotion against duty because, because both of them spent time at Jesus' feet and both of them had served. It has to do with priorities, okay? And therefore tell her to help me. And Jesus answered and said to her, Martha, Martha, you're worried and troubled about many things, but one thing is needed, and Mary has chosen that good part which will not be taken away from her. Now, before you condemn Martha, um, uh, when Sarah uh, Bowling was here, in fact, she's going to be here, I think, uh, uh, Friday. When she was here a couple of years ago, she taught about Martha, and she said, you know, later, Martha got the lesson here because because when her brother Lazarus, when their brother Lazarus died, Martha left everybody first. She left before Mary. She left all the house and came to Jesus first. So she learned her lesson. Amen? But this is a picture of two different types of Christians. One whose soul was prospering and at rest, and one whose soul was full of anxiety and not prospering. So the focus of this scripture lesson is not about pitting devotion against duty, is it? Is it, a put, is it about pitting? Uh, is it about uh, put, putting uh, devotion against duty, like saying, "Well, if I'm going to choose one or the other, I'll choose devotion," but then you don't ever serve? He's not saying that, is he? He's not saying we shouldn't serve because verse 39 tells us that Martha also sat at Jesus' feet. And verse 40 tells us that Mary also served. This is a lesson about how priorities and focus affect the condition of somebody's soul. Everybody say priorities and focus. So Martha was distracted. See, a, dis a, a distracted soul is one that's all wrought up and angry and disturbed, you know, by... Somebody else is not doing what I'm doing. And, and, and she was envious of her sister. In verse 41, Jesus said that caused her to become worried and troubled about many things. In other words, her soul was not prospering, was it? Martha's soul was not prospering, was it? Jesus was in her house, but not the focus of her attention. Can you see that? And that's a condition of many Christians today. And Jesus said one thing is needed, coming to Jesus with our attention focused on Him, not on one another or not on our problems. Guys, when we come to Jesus, if you're going to find rest for your souls, you don't come to Jesus first with all your prayer requests. You come to Jesus in worship and then, and then, Lord, help me get my cares cast over on you. 
What, what are you troubled about? What are you fearful about? What are you concerned about? What are you distracted about? What, who's your sandpaper person that you've let stand between you and Jesus? Don't look on the right or the left and incriminate yourself. But when you come to Jesus, it's not just about, you know, you know, Lord, give me some great revelation. It's about getting the things off of your out of your soul. He said, when you come, when you come and pray to me, shut your door. Shut your door. In Matt, was it Matthew 6, I believe. Shut your door. Shut your door on what? On all the things you're worried about, concerned about. You know, finances. I get it over on you. And a lot of times it's like sticky fly paper. I get it. You get it off and it's on the other hand still. And you know, so you got to take time getting your cares over on the Lord. Nobody can cast your cares on the Lord but you. Nobody can do that for you. And you get it off, get it off, get it off until you can worship God without focus on anything else. You shut your door on everything else except just your intimate time with Him so you can hear Him. Guys, this, this, is, this is kingdom life. And sometimes it takes me 20 or 30 minutes to get my cares over on the Lord. I don't care how long it takes. I'm going to stay in there until I get my cares on the Lord so I can focus on Him and give Him my, the, my mind's attention instead of renting space in my mind to the, everybody else that's doing wrong or troubling me or whatever. What is that to you? You follow Jesus. Are you hearing me? Yes. Mary chose that as a priority in her life. And then Jesus said, nothing, all the good things that, that Mary's heard at my feet, the same thing you've heard, none of that's going to be taken from her. It was implied the same things you've heard from me that Mary heard because you, you didn't get your cares over on the Lord. You've allowed all that distraction. It's going to be the enemy. You're giving place to the enemy to eat your lunch and what? You're, you're, you're giving place to the enemy to steal that revelation from you. And when your focus is an att is an att and attention is on Him, the enemy will not be able to take from you so easily. An anxious soul is easy prey to the enemy. Yes? yes? It provides an open door to attack against your health and your finances. Now look at a... Look at Psalm 23 with me. Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my what? And He leads me in paths of righteousness for His name's sake. And yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death... I will fear no evil because you're with me, your rod and your staff. They comfort me and you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You, you can go on and read the blessing that comes. I shall not want. Financial and physical needs are met when you come to the Lord. The context of my needs being met uh, is, is verse 2. Yielding to my shepherd when he leads me to lie down, stop working, and lay aside self-effort. And following His leadership in camping by still waters, waters of rest. I'm talking about in our soul, guys. I'm not talking about circumstances of life. Because, look, He'll, he'll feed you. He'll, he'll prepare a table before you in the presence of your enemies, but you only apprehend that and inherit that and walk in that and appropriate that when you let your when you get your soul at rest. When you're when you're when you're not anxious and you're not full of worry and and, and trouble because of what the enemy is doing around you. Are you hearing me? And so many of us in our souls live in camp. At, at the raging turbulent waters, constant unrest and uncertainty. How many of you want to follow a leader like that? You want to follow a leader that's that's their soul is constantly full of anxiety and and no. 
but taking time to come aside from self-effort, struggles, troubles, and to rest by the still waters by coming to Him, the Good Shepherd. That's the process He uses to restore our souls. And failure to do so, guys, uh, in, in, you know, is, results in more of the same. Troubles, anxieties, worries, problems, turbulent, turbulent waters in various areas of your life. Look at, look at Mark chapter 3. Mark chapter 3. We, we looked at this in, uh, in part in, a, in our course on, on excellence in ministry, but uh, it, it bears witness to, uh, for us to hear it again. Mark chapter 3, and Jesus had prayed all night. Um, let's see, am I in the right? Mark 3, yeah. Uh, um, in ver verse 13, and he went up on the mountain and called to them those he himself wanted, and they came to him. Then he appointed 12 that they might what? Be with him. Everybody say with him. With him. Guys, that's the key. Before he, before he sent them out to preach, before he sent them out to cast out devils, before he sent them out to heal the sick, before he sent them out in their, in their kingdom assignment, their first assignment, he called the 12 that they might be with him. And I shared this with you about uh, Francis Frangipane was very busy uh, in testimony that uh, was he very busy in ministry and he was doing a lot of things in ministry and I heard his testimony that he was at this conference. I mean, everything was going well in his ministry, pastoring a large church and also conference speaker. And this little lady came to him and spoke to him and, and said, I've got a word from the Lord for, for you, Francis. And she said, he said, okay, share it with me. And she said, the Lord told me to tell you Tell Francis I miss him. And he said it just smote his heart because he'd allowed himself, his soul, to be full of unrest and full of anxiety and full of no peace. And guys, that's not a prosperous soul. We, we've got, we, it's not about a legalistic how many times we, we spend with the Lord, how much time on our knees. It's not about that at all. It's about, you know, He's present with us 24-7, right? The, here's the question. Are we present to Him? And just spending time with Him. What a privilege that we have to spend time with Him. Apart from quality time with the Lord, we will appropriate no significant power in our lives. No power to save, no power to heal, no power to deliver or provide. And you know what, God will, God, it's, not that, it's not that if you haven't spent so much time with the Lord that you can't go out and do ministry, that's not the point. But guys, remember, he, he spoke to the church at Ephesus and he said, you've been doing all, you're doing all these things right, but I've got one thing against you, that you've left your first love. And he said, look, if you don't repent the anointing that's on your ministry in life, I'm not going to attach my anointing to a life that's full of stress and strife and, and is not spending time with me because our life is dependent upon him. And our power and authority is dependent upon him. Eternal life, said John 17, 3, is knowing him. Appropriating the benefits of eternal life, guys, can only be realized by coming to Him regularly, knowing Him, and finding rest for your soul. This is the foundation of a prosperous soul. Would you uh, stand up with me for a moment? Let me pray for you. Father, we just yield ourselves to You today. And we come to You, Jesus. And, and, and we just declare, Lord, uh, help us to get our cares, our anxiety, all worry and fear uh, on you, over on you, and we'll find rest for our souls.
We, we come to you, Jesus. Just tell them, I come to you, Jesus. Find rest for my soul. In Jesus' name. Now, Father, I release the, the power of God, the presence of God, the ability of God to, to get out of stress, to get out of striving, to get our cares over on you so that we can appropriate your presence and walk in the fullness of your power. In Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. Amen. God bless you guys.